Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. Today our topic of discussion is infertility or the lack of fertility. <sighs> Defined technically, it means that a couple who's having frequent sex, particularly around the time of ovulation, if they're unable to conceive within 12 months, it is what's called a fertility problem. This issue has risen substantially due to num numerous causes and factors, and we'll talk about those. But we find now between 16 to 25 percent of couples now have conception infertility problems. That's a almost a, that's a quarter of the couples out there. Um, part of it also has to do with is we tend to uh, get married and have babies a little later on in life, and so we're a little less fertile as well too. Um, one of the key issues in the statistical data I thought was really important to put out that over the past 50 years, it appears in the United States that we've had a 1 to 1.5 percent decline per year, and that's exponential, one year on top of the other, of sperm count and caused by these factors that I'll be listing here and, and other things as well, too, which is decreasing our um, ability to have kids. 40 percent of the issues have to do with male infertility, about 60% have to do with female infertility, and that's because us females are much more complicated. Oh, take that as a joke. Huh? Um, when we're looking at causes, and, and I think the number one, and I put this number one, has to do with poor nutrition and nutritional deficiencies. If you don't have certain minerals, certain vitamins, you can't ovulate properly, you can't conceive properly, you can't produce sperm properly, properly, the mobility of the sperm can't be there. So first of all, before anybody thinks about having babies, they need to address their nutrition and their diet. A good nutritionist, someone uh, who has a background in nutrition would be an excellent way to go. And then of course reading on your own to try and improve your diet and nutrition. Another factor of the 20th century more than ever is stress. We've got women working full time, guys working harder than other, one or two jobs. We got people working a lot. And you know in Europe when they talk about holiday automatically of four weeks vacation a year, good luck if the average American gets a week or two off. That's just the way it is. So we've got a lot more stress, a lot less ways to relieve stress, and we work, 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 hence we are the most productive country in the world. But it lends itself to a lot of stress. Environmental toxins and toxic metals. In my opinion, other than China, we are probably one of the most toxic, chemical-laden countries in the world. And you go, what do you mean? We got the FDA, the EPA. We, got we use more chemical additives and over 3,000 in our foods, our chemical pesticides, our fuel oils, our synthetic fabrics that we like. Chemical, chemical, chemical. Everything we touch, our copy paper, our ink, everything, full of chemicals. So is it any wonder, based upon a lot of studies we've been reading about these estrogen mimickers and these um, polyphenols, bisphenol A, um, all these things that are um, cancer causing uh, are problematic for fertility as well. Congenital abnormalities, obviously there can be issues where a woman isn't born with completed fallopian tubes, her ovaries never developed. There are issues in males, testes and, and testes um, development, inability to regulate heat because more heat that's held within a man, the less sperm the pr uh, production is, so, uh, which also is um, environmental issues too. So when they say for guys to wear boxers when you're trying to conceive, Guys wear boxers. We don't like a lot of heat. We don't want the testes being held up close to the body when you're trying to increase fertility. Um, in females, we've seen a lot of issues with blocked fallopian tubes due to chlamydia and other um, diseases, sexual transmitted diseases, endometriosis and, and uterine fibroids, which are being driven by all these es environmental estrogens that everybody's ingesting in all their foods. And good old EPA, FDA says, no problem eating that strawberry lace with malathion and chemicals. Yummy, yummy. Doesn't cause you any problems. Well, that kills bugs. That prevents bugs from being able to replicate. What is it going to do to our body? A lot. A lot. What is it doing to the birds and all the waterfowl, you know, waterfowl particularly? 
their fertility is dropping. I can remember years ago when I was in college, and we won't say how many, the peregrine falcon uh, was almost extinct because its eggs were so very, very fine that when the eggs would be laid, they would break because of all the environmental estrogens and toxins. Um, and so the same thing kind of happens to us in our bodies. Cervical mucus. Um, the more acidic a woman is, particularly if her diet's very acidic, she's very yeasty, she eats a lot of sugar, junk, that kills sperm. Bottom line, it like acidifies them and they're gone. It destroys them. So alkaline the body uh, and eating, um, and we'll talk about more in diet, um, changes that pH level. Um, women over 34 years of age now are much more prevalent in having babies. And once you're over the age of 34, in some of us, unlike me, I get pregnant easily, but some of us, when we're age 34 and above, as a generality, our fertility decreases. Low, low sperm count, and obviously we talked about potential environmental toxins affecting uh, sperm count, but we have circulatory issues having to do with um, how the blood vessels um, feed into the testes. Uh, we have injuries. We have a lot of, uh, and we're seeing a lot of endocrine disorders, uh, endocrine disorders, um, which are going to be thyroid issues, low levels of progesterone. Uh, and hmm, we're having some real changes in our male testosterone levels as well, too, declining at a steady rate. So we have a decline in testosterone, an increase in estrogens, and we're going to end up with a very female-like male who's not going to produce very viable Y-chromosome sperm. So, uh-oh. Uh, eating disorders and obesity. Okay, the more heavy you are, you have, you carry more environmental estrogens, you carry more, well, you're estrogenic, you have more blood sugar issues, you have these kinds of things when you're obese. So it's much more difficult for a woman to conceive and for a man to produce good quality sperm as well. We know that anorexia, bulimia, those types of disorders cause a lot of nutritional deficiencies. So people suffering from those or who have suffered from that in the, er in the early ages. That's why it's really important to diagnose it among teens. It can permanently, permanently render a woman infertile. So this nutrition, this keeping things flowing as far as the diet is concerned, is paramount. And let's examine that. Um, meals with organic, and I want to highlight, frame everything I can about organic. You know, the news poo-poos this, but i got to tell you, obviously the chemicals on there, you wouldn't sit there and ingest in and of themselves. And they say they wash off, that's baloney. It grows within the plant, it's within the soil, it becomes a part of the plant's chemistry, and it changes the RNA DNA of that plant as well. Which in turn, guess what, when we ingest it, it changes our RNA DNA as well. So, organic, organic, lots of good wholesome vegetables. A lot of people aren't vegetable eaters, and that's problematic. Become one if you want to have good, healthy children. Eat a lot of nuts, cold-pressed oils, flax oil, fish oils that are more likely to distill or guaranteed not to contain mercury and PCPs. i got to tell you, we have some major warehouses around here that sell tons of fish oil and flax oil and stuff, and they're full of chemicals. I wouldn't touch them. I tell people, don't finish them off and come back into my store. Throw them away and buy the right one now because they're so laden full of chemicals. Um, men who eat pumpkin seeds actually can increase their ability to conceive. And the rates were different anywhere from 10 to 15% because it's very, they're very zinc rich. And I'm not talking about the roasted ones that are yummy full of salt. I'm talking about raw pumpkin seeds. That can help with fertility pretty substantially. And we'll talk about the reason why when it comes to zinc. Avoiding sugar, white flour, anything that's acidic. And you can go online and you can punch in alkali foods or um, acid-producing foods. And you can get a list of the foods that will be alkali and a list that will be acid. And actually, I know I have in my store this little thing I hand out to people left and right. It's a copy of this chart that basically shows acid and alkali foods. It's a good guide. Anyway, you can go online. Alkali, organic fruits and vegetables, keep good quality proteins. Now, when we're talking about meat, when meat is an organic, I got to tell you, it's full of growth hormone, it's full of chemicals. Chickens are full of arsenic. 
tetracycline, you just name it. And we're going to ingest this and eat this and expect it's not going to change our RNA, DNA. We're not just talking about a fertility or infertility problem here. We're talking about whether our babies are going to be born normal. Um, I have a friend of mine who's an RN um, at the Marion Hospital. And he tells me, uh, in my uh, discussion I had with him long ago, he's seeing, actually recently, more recently, I, he says he has seen more deformities, problematic natal types of stuff in the, in the baby unit than he's ever seen before. Freaky things. Freaky things. Because of all these doggone chemicals that we're ingesting. Avoid fried and processed foods, especially trans fats. They're hormone disruptors. We like to keep our hormones stable, particularly our progesterones, estrogens, and testosterone. So as a result, if we eat a lot of fried trans fatty foods, they're hormone disruptors. Go figure. So not only will it lend itself to infertility, it's going to lend itself to PMS and people with attitudes. I prefer not to have people with attitudes around. Avoid alcohol. It reduces sperm count like there ain't no tomorrow. It also reduces potency as well and other things in men. Um, another discussion. But it causes sperm count to dramatically drop. And it makes the sperm kind of stick together. It's like, oh, you're going to use alcohol here? Ooh, we don't want you to replicate. So keep that in mind when you're trying to conceive both female and male. Avoid coffee, soft drinks, chocolate, any caffeine-rich foods. Caffeine, for some reason, reduces also huh, fertility as well. So in addition, these are pretty acidic uh, or acidifying foods. So you want to avoid them, if at all possible, when you're, when you're thinking about getting pregnant. You know, it's really interesting. If you can think about ahead of time how to get yourself healthy and be healthy and in a good position before you ever think about being pregnant or being the sperm donor, then bottom line is you need to be healthy. Supplements. And some of these are things that you need to be getting in a good multivitamin. Some of these things are additions. Or if you've had a problem conceiving. Like, for example, a good multiple vitamin high in B vitamins. Every guy should be taking that. And every girl that's thinking about getting pregnant should be on a good prenatal. And I'm not talking about the one the doc gives you, prescription. And I'm going to say this boldly. Maybe I shouldn't. But it has eight or nine ingredients in there. No minerals. Low on B vitamins. It's junk. So if a doctor tries to hand you a prescription prenatal, I wouldn't do it. I'd look for a good prenatal that has 800 micrograms of folic acid, that has minerals and Bs, that maybe comes from a whole food uh, type of source, something your body's going to assimilate. Because it isn't just vitamins that help us with, with our, with our um, pregnancies. It's minerals, too. And I, and I think the pharmaceutical companies have forgotten that we also need minerals in our vitamins. Go cool. figure, huh? Basics, basics. Um, if you have a difficult time getting pregnant or you've had endometriosis or fibroids, which, you know, as we discussed earlier, decrease the ability to get pregnant, natural progesterone creams, and I can't tell you the number of women that I've had that have researched this, that have come in and they go on it for two or three months, boom, they're pregnant. So, progesterone helps you hold on to an egg. So, if it's, if it's, the male sperm count and everything's fine, but the woman's having a hard time. She's miscarrying a lot, not holding on to her pregnancy. This can, uh, usage of progesterone cream, supervised by a, a healthcare professional. I, I think that's a good idea. Now, doctors, most doctors don't believe in natural progesterone creams, so you're going to have to find either an MD that has a natural background or you're going to have to find a natural um, pathic doctor or somebody that's got good working knowledge on this. Vitex. And what's really cool, and there's a particular chemical compound you want to look here uh, for when you're looking for Bitex, but you take it each morning, it stimulates the ovaries to ovulate. A lot of women are having problems with luteinizing and other things that are necessary to stimulate actual ovulation. It also helps normalize the uh, progesterone levels. I love to pull the studies. You know me. I'm a scientist. I like to pull the studies. And study of 48 infertile women after three months Seven of them ended up being pregnant, and 25 of them finally sustained a normal um, progesterone level. So guess what? Just give them time, they'll be pregnant too. So once again, we're talking about these estrogen levels being skyrocket high, 
and we're talking xenoestrogens, not the good estrogens that are found in our body, which compete for all these natural progesterones and things that stimulate uh, natural progesterone. Iron. Don't get pregnant if your iron levels run low. And as a matter of fact, get a good checkup before you're thinking about getting pregnant because iron deficiencies not only cause you to be low iron, but guess what? Baby's low iron and iron helps you transfer oxygen. Babies and you need all the oxygen you can go into your brains because you don't want an oxygen deprived baby because then you have disabilities and other issues that stem later on down the line. Paba, there are studies that support that 100 milligrams four times a day, she's like, ah, oh, four times a day, improve the effects of estrogens and chronic infertility. Paba, a simple, what we, it's put in the B vitamin category, but it's of its own. Selenium, 200 micrograms a day, and please don't exceed that amount. Uh, selenium, very anti-cancer, very good. But most men are zinc and selenium deficient. Uh, it's not in our foods anymore, guys. Good old commercial farming, it ain't there no more. Very rare. And sometimes multivitamins will put 30 or 50. Um, there's some that actually put some in that are a little higher. Um, but additional amounts of selenium can be very helpful because it increases sperm count and female fertility. Works on both ends. Natural vitamin E. Boy, you know, my doc recommended this years ago for fibroids. My family tends to have fibrocystic breast, and vitamin E can help, and I don't have them now anymore because I'm smart. I do stuff like this. But the vitamin E also, when you look at it here, helps with hormonal stabilization and increases, increases sperm count. Vitamin E is kind of, and selenium and zinc are kind of the, the male things to do to get that sperm count up and the motility better as well. Zinc, 30 milligrams twice a day, but you're going to balance it with about 3 milligrams of copper. Zinc without copper, well, lack of copper will make your hair gray, it'll make you a little mentally unstable. We have enough mentally unstable people in the world today. Let's do the zinc with copper. L-arginine, I like the studies again, 2,000 milligrams twice a day, and it needs to be on an empty stomach. And L-arginine, we've discussed, also lowers blood pressure, it helps with male erections, all those wonderful things. But Studies show that 62% of men markedly increase their sperm count in two months. Two months. Resulting in 28 pregnancies out of 178 people. Whoa. That's a substantial data. You combine that with some of these other things, we're going to get a baby made. And we're going to get a good, healthy baby made because the nutrition needs to be there, too. Uh, Panistogensine, um, an ancient Chinese remedy. Um, also helps with fertility. It is also known as a tonic for virility, and it's used by the it's been used by the emperors for centuries to help make a man more virile and fertile. There's a lot more I could have added to this. There are tests that can be conducted, endocrine tests for thyroid. So if you have a family history of thyroid hormone problems, um, I'd get that thyroid hormone full panel check. Um, Progesterone levels difficult to detect, but if you tend to uh, have issues with, with losing a baby, there is a saliva test for um, progesterone and DHEA. And then in males, of course, there's blood work for testosterone and what we call free testosterone. Anyway, I hope this helps. Next, we're going to be moving on to the fitness portion of our show. Thank you. Welcome to the fitness portion of our show, and for my wonderful audience out there, I'm on my hands and knees today because I want to show you a couple of yoga moves, and I learned this from my cat, and I learned this from my dog. As I watched them wake up in the morning and kind of stretch around, I thought, you know what? What a good idea. You know, I kind of put my arms in the air, and I kind of twist around and kind of stretch things out when I wake up. But I'm going to show you a couple of exercises that I know we can learn from the animals. So here we go. First of all, for my kitty cat, Blas, you raise the spine up, just kind of curl things up, and then you bring it back to horizontal. And you raise it back up, and you bring it back to horizontal. 
Now my doggy Kaylee, right when I get her up in the morning, she's doing this thing. She's going to sit here and she gets down like this and she just kind of curls her back and she arches it and then she goes back to normal. And then she'll go down and she'll kind of curl it a little bit. That's called the dog position when we kind of go down. Um, arching's cat, dog, I'm sorry, going up is cat, going arch is dog. And so that can help wake up the spine, get things moving as long as you can get up and down on the floor. That might be a little a nice addition first thing in the morning. Hey, we can learn all kinds of things from the animals. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today is Ralph Torciano. Ralph? Thank you for the intro. Absolutely. Well, when speaking about what not to do with babies, here is one bit of advice. Do not put them in baby soap that has fragrance. Why? Well, they had a team of uh, scientists from the Department of Analytical Chemistry and Nutrition and Bromatology uh, at USC decide to test some of these fragrant baby shampoos and soaps. What they found in these soaps is up to about 15 different types of allergens in the soaps. What's amazing is one of the 15 samples they had had all 15 allergens in it. The other ones all had allergens, period. On average, each baby soap had about six allergens per bottle or brand. They found no and I repeat, zero uh, forms of baby soaps or fragrance shampoos that had no allergens whatsoever. And again, nothing below six. In some for the scientists out there, some of the allergens were as high as 100 parts per million. So again, one thing not to do with the baby, don't put it in soap. A baby soap, they're usually in the bathtub for about 15 minutes, they can cause a maze of problems. Now, how about a new smart aspirin? Well, we have one. It's been under our nose for quite some time, and believe it or not, it's pine bark, or otherwise known as pycnogenol. It's in the news again. What's amazing about pine bark, which the scientists discovered, and this is in a recent article published in the International Journal of Immunopharmacology, is they discovered that pine bark is incredible at controlling inflammation and by reducing what's called a becoming a COX-2 inhibitor. What was interesting about it is it only became a COX-2 inhibitor when there were elevated inflammatory compounds in the blood to begin with. So it's kind of like an aspirin. It only turns itself on when need be. In addition to that, it affected COX-1 enzymes not at all. It's an incredible form of uh, natural enzymes, for example, aspirin, I should say. And pycnogenol, besides that, they found in cases incredibly good for asthma when it was caused by something called 5-LOX. They found it worked with acne. Uh, they found it worked with sunburn, skin inflammation, uh, C-reactive proteins, arthritis, you name it. Pycnogenol is pretty cool. A little bit more expensive than aspirin, but you know what? Why not? It works a heck of a lot better. It's cheaper than a, uh, basically most of your happy meals at some of your fast food restaurants. Now those for the bad kidney conditions. This is an interesting one. I usually don't care, I tend to talk more about life end or basically uh, very serious diseases per se, except when it comes to this one aspect because it's so cheap and so effective. Sodium bicarbonate, baking soda. Why? When they gave baking soda to people with bad kidney disease, they looked into this with 134 people, and this is the Journal of American Society of Nephrology. They found this. It stopped the decline of kidney function by as much as two-thirds. And quote unquote, they said, in fact, in patients taking sodium bicarbonate, the rate of decline in kidney function was similar to the normal age-related decline, period. They also said, quote, rapid progression of kidney disease occurred in just 9% of the patients taking sodium bicarbonate. And it happened in 45% of those that did not. Very cool, very simple, extremely inexpensive, and vital. After that, we look at prevention of cataracts. 
Well, here's a little substance that had some prior information at ahead of time, but this time they did a really good study, at least with animals with cataracts. And it's an amino acid that you can put in your eye called carnosine. How effective was it? Well, let me tell you. Basically, when the lens of the eyes became clouded, they gave them a traditional treatment, which was called guanidine, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. One given to that, the lenses still, still were clouded. But when they took guanidine and they mixed it with carnosine, they developed 50 to 60% less cloudiness when given antagonists. In fact, carnosine not only did that, it did this. It restored most of the clarity to the clouded lenses. They were affected by the cataracts. In fact, they said, quote, the results demonstrate the potential of use in carnosine for preventing and treating cataracts, period. Cool, simple, cheap, something you should be able to find fairly readily everywhere. And now, quick note on thyroid cancer. The, basically, the rates of thyroid cancer are not going up because of better screening. In fact, the rates of thyroid cancer have been increasing an average about 10% per year since 1997. The scientists basically from the American Cancer Society said it's environmental. Just a quick note when someone's just telling you that it's being picked up by screening, it's not. Look at your environment around you, keep it as chemical free as possible. Back to hormone therapy. I know it comes in the news again, the estrogen progesterone thing, but it's still there. Now they're related directly to ovarian cancer. Why is this important? Because of this. They said, this is the Journal of American Medical Association, came out on the 15th, the risk of ovarian cancer happened regardless of the duration of use. It happened even at short term. They followed almost 900,000 women to come up with that data. It's not being made up. But there is a little bit of hope for that. Curcurum. Why? Because they found out that curcurum helped reduce a lot of the cancers which are caused by people taking the hormones. Most often with, of course, breast cancer and memory type cancer. What surprised me, according to the University of Missouri, 6 million women in the United States are still doing hormone therapy. Now, I've got a case, there's exceptions to every rule why they have to be taking it. But they found that it basically stopped a lot of the carcinogenic effect of what was causing those issues very readily and very effective. In fact, they also said too, in regards to mammary tumors, curcum delays development of mammary tumors has been accepted now in the publication in Menopause the Journal of North American Menopause Society. So it is beginning to make its way in there. And again, turmeric, curcum is a spice derived from that. And after that, basically, we want to look at ADD drugs, and especially at Dr. Joseph Biderman. This is a man that wanted his record sealed. What did Joseph Biderman do? Well, he was responsible for basically the 40-fold incre increase in drugs being prescribed to your kids, especially ADD, antipsychotic medications, the whole lineup. And why do I have a problem with this? Because basically they reported that he told the drug companies ahead of time that he was going to make those studies favorable for them, even though all the science came out that these drugs were dangerous to your kids. Dangerous man. Get him out of here. Wow. Well, thank, thank you very you. much for that. Thank you, Ralph. Appreciate it very much. Once again, take your health into your own hands. Do your own research. There's websites to go to. Take care of yourself. Thank you very much for joining our show.